Most people today want everything to be smaller, thinner, and lighter, from their phones all the way to their cameras. But some people still like to go old school and carry the big gear around, which of course brings with it challenges and advantages. For example, did you know that F45 can kind of be the equivalent of F16? We'll explain that and large format color film with my guest Ben Horn on this episode of Behind the Shot. <laughs> Hi, once again, welcome back to another episode of Behind the Shot. I'm your host, Steve Brazel. As usual, you will find a blog post associated with this episode at thisweekinphoto.com. Also at thisweekinphoto.com, you can find all the links that you need so that you can subscribe to the podcast. And I do recommend that you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app, in iTunes, wherever it is that you consume your podcasts. Again, you can always reach out to me on uh, Twitter, Raz2. You can reach out to me on Instagram. It's Steve Brazel. On Facebook, it's Steve Brazel. Brazzle Photography. If you've got any suggestions, if you've got any questions, I'm always open to the feedback. Same on YouTube. You can do it there as well. So Behind the Shot is the podcast where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots, a forensic look at one of their photographs, as it were. And today's guest is a first. I had somebody contact me through the form at This Week in Photo that is following every blog post related to Behind the Shot, a guy by the name of Jay Tayag, and Jay, I apologize if I mispronounced your name, but Jay filled out the form and requested that I get this guest on Behind the Shot. And I'll be honest, I was not familiar with Ben's work, but boy am I now, because he does the type of work I would love to do, except I don't. So uh, with that in mind, Ben Horn, welcome to Behind the Shot, man. Thanks so much, Steve. It's uh, awesome to be here. Yeah, it's nice to have you here. Like I say, you were a suggestion from somebody in, in a form that we have at the bottom of every blog post at thisweekinphoto.com. And uh, they suggested, Jay Tayag suggested that I get you on. And part of the thing that he said is that he loved your YouTube channel because I answered him back and said, no problem. You know, I'll do that. And he, oh yeah, you got to check out his YouTube channel and, and your YouTube channel, you've got over 25,000 subscribers, almost 26,000 subscribers at this point. Uh, but let's talk about you a little bit. First of all, you're San Diego based. So you're a fellow Californian like me. Are you, are you originally from San Diego? Born and raised. Born and raised. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. So you live in the good life down there. <laughs> yeah. That's all I know. Yeah. You, you've got the weather going on. You are a landscape photographer, but I want to qualify that you're not your everyday landscape photographer. You're a photographer that's a different beast from most landscape photographers. Explain to people why that is. So ever since about 2009, I decided to uh, start working with large format film. And uh, the camera I started with, it uses a four by five inch film and very, very simple cameras. It really makes it kind of work for every single shot. And not long after that, I decided to get an 8x10 camera. That's what I've been shooting ever since uh, 2010. And it just takes a lot of discipline um, because you have to really think things through ahead of time. And uh, sometimes you're very limited as far as how much film you can carry. So it really, it's those limitations that really kind of, um, kind of I, I think, helps, shapes me, helps to shape me as a photographer so that I can... Um, sort of focus my attention on the things that I can shoot as opposed to the many things that these cameras really are not set up well to to shoot. You know, it's interesting because you say 8 by 10 film. So I'm picturing like the Old West, right, where they would slide a film cartridge in and it was 8 by 10 and it's, you know, whatever, half an inch thick or whatever. That's what you're talking about, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, so you I mean, have they, one of those old wooden cameras. Um, I have, I actually have a few of them. Um, but yeah, so I, the one I got started with, it's a wooden camera, leather bellows. It looks like a really old camera, but it is a modern camera. Um, they make these actually, today? Oh yeah. Um, the, uh, the one I've used for the longest, it's from a company called Ebony and, uh, they're out of Japan. They're not around anymore, but, uh, yeah, it's a very simple camera, uh, very similar to like what Ansel Adams would use. Um, but I, I have to say it as it's a, a very mature technology where things aren't really changing much with regard to the cameras, which is kind of a, a nice thing because you don't have to worry about the latest and greatest cameras coming out and kind of trying to follow the curve of everything that's out there because it's a very mature technology already. See, and, and one of the things you mentioned was you really have to think about your shot and, and what I like about it is you see that as improving your photography, whereas most people nowadays are, I, you know, with digital, I can shoot 1000 shots and pick two. 
you look at it as improving your photography because you do have to, you know, stop down. Think about the shot like Ansel used to do. You mentioned Ansel Adams, you know, with his levels of, of you know, gray. Um, you have to plan what you're going to do or you've wasted an eight by 10 piece of film, which I'm curious now they just hit me. What is that worth a piece of film eight by 10? So it depends on the film you shoot. But the one I, f- I use the most is uh, Fuji Velvia 50, which is a slide film. And the sheet of film cost me about $20 per uh, sheet of film. And then the processing is about another $10. So it's about $30 a click. Um, but for every most click. Scene, every click. But for most scenes, if it's something that I have some confidence in, I actually expose two sheets of film just because you want to have that backup safety shot. So in reality, every photo amounts to roughly $60 or so, give or take. Okay, but but now think about this for a minute. Most people go out, handheld, tripod, doesn't matter, click, 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 three shot HDR, whatever they need to do. Here's a guy in Ben Horn who goes out into the wilderness. And if he shoots three clicks, it just cost him $100. And, but I, I can see how that would improve your photography. There's an old um, uh, uh, like lesson for, for photography schools that I heard years ago where an instructor would tell the students, I want you to take one prime lens. I want you to go into a parking lot at a high school, whatever. I want you to spend all day, one hour, two hours, whatever you can spend in the parking lot and only take pictures in the parking lot. And that limitation forces you to think be creative, realize what the camera's capable of and not another friend of mine. I had him on, I think it was episode 19, Matthias Hombauer. Uh, he shoots periodically a manual focus lens and he does it for partially the same reason. One, it's a really nice lens, but two, it limits him, which forces him to really concentrate. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, a limitation is, is really important. Um, because I, I think when you're when you go to an area, especially a very beautiful area, um, like some of these really nice canyons I like to go to in southern Utah, there's so many things surrounding you that are so beautiful. But if you have some sort of limitation in the camera, it kind of forces you to kind of look at certain subjects more than others and kind of seek out those subjects. And I, I think by working with these, you know, these cameras over the past, I don't know, it was eight years or whatever, uh, it kind of has given me a sense of style with the photos because I mean, I can't even shoot if it's windy, if it's windy, it's going to shake the camera or, I mean, I'm going to have some long exposure. So leaves are going to move on trees. So, um, so I end up having to really just limit myself, but I, I think the end results are very sort of calm and sort of quiet images because that's kind of the conditions I have to have when I take them to begin with. The, the problem is the cost, but I'm wondering now, do you ever kind of experiment with that? What would happen? I want to get into this shot, but I keep coming up with, pick, with, with questions. What would happen if you shot this? And like you just said, even if the wind comes up, it moves the camera, right? Or the leaves move. Let's say it was a breeze. So the leaves were moving, but it wasn't moving the camera. Have you ever experimented to get that kind of natural motion blur where the trunk of a tree might stay totally still, but you'll get a soft, long exposure feel just from the leaves. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, usually in my experience of doing that, it usually just always looks like a mistake as opposed to something that's intentional. Um, So that's why I I usually try to wait for things to calm down. But I mean, it can be interesting if it's like really windy. Maybe you like put an ND filter on there and get an extra long exposure and, and really make it look intentional. And I think at that point, it could look kind of interesting. Uh, but typically, if it's that windy, yeah, my camera's going to be moving around. So that's going to be going to be really difficult to do. Well, and people will see what I mean. Let, let's pull this shot up really quick and talk about this shot. So this shot, I looked through your entire website and there were a couple that we talked about and, and we settled on this one, which is called Life Force. Where was this taken? So this was taken in a canyon in southern Utah uh, that I went, I visited it on a backpacking trip this past spring. And it's uh, it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. I, I don't really like to say exactly where it is just because, you know, photographers usually like to follow each other to a certain extent. And try and replicate, um, yeah. Yeah. And and some of these areas, they, they can't take a ton of visits. So I'm always pretty general about where I am. But a uh, it's in a really, really nice canyon in southern Utah that I backpacked into in the spring. So when you backpack in, you're carrying this giant 
eight by 10 film camera. What is that way? So the whole pack weighed probably about 60 pounds, but that's, you know, food, water, so shelter. It's not horrible. It's not bad, um, but I'm it's pretty bulky. minimal on the other stuff. It, it is bulky. And if you're climbing up a, a hill in very deep sand, yeah, you're, you're going to really notice that. Um, but yeah, it's actually not too bad. And I'm actually hoping to make my pack a little bit lighter on future trips because there's another camera coming out that's lighter. Um, but yeah, I can I can totally carry that camera in with me. Uh, I can take up to about a week's worth of food. But the main limitation is film. Uh, typically, I can take about four film holders, which means I can take eight photos on perhaps a one week long trip. And that's it. And that's it. Unless somebody drops some from a helicopter. For you. Yeah. You know, I'm that, just saying that would be awesome. There could be a business model in that. Yeah. Drone delivery. Of yeah, film. Drone, I, yeah. I, I, hey, I, Jeff I, Bezos, I'd be all over we've that. got it. We've got an idea for Amazon. Yeah. Um, so when you're shooting film like this, let's get the geek stuff out of the way for those mm -hmm. photographers first. Do you know the exposure on this shot? Uh, so I know it's at F45 just because I shoot pretty much everything at F45. I'd say that, uh, shooting my eight by 10 camera at F45 is kind of like shooting a full frame SLR at maybe like F16 or so. It's kind of wait, a, wait, wait, well, let me stop you there. Mm -hmm. They're not equivalent. Um, well the, the numbers, in other words, the F45 of, is not F45. It is, but when it comes to depth of field with the focal lengths of these lenses. So uh, as an example, uh, this photo is taken with my 300 millimeter normal lens. So it's a focal length of 300 millimeters, but the angle of view is equivalent to maybe shooting a 50 millimeter lens on a really? full frame camera. And that's because of the, well, because I was going to say sensor size. There's no sensor. It's because yeah. of the size of the film, though, is effectively relation an effective relation to a sensor size in a digital camera. Mm -hmm. And that film and, is so large, mm -hmm. it would be like shooting on an eight by 10 sensor. Yeah. And, and so basically um, if I shoot, I mean, F45 is F45, but in terms of depth of field, um, F16 is kind of a good way of describing it where you're not going to get everything in focus. Um, you'll get a good chunk of it. Um, but, uh, but I find that that's kind of middle ground aperture. Cause if I start stopping down more than F 45, the 64 and beyond that, I start hitting diffraction similar to on a full frame camera. If you shoot like F 22 or F 32. Okay. Um, so it's, it's best to kind of avoid going beyond 45. So it's, um, so it's F 45 and probably about, I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 20 second long exposure on a ISO 50 speed film. Can you, so you're, you're locked in at 50 because of that film. Correct. And how long did you say the exposure was? Probably somewhere between 10 and 20 seconds, somewhere in that range. Okay. So I'm guessing this was not, you know, using the equivalence in my head of, of about F16. This was not really bright out. Uh, yeah, it, it wasn't very bright. It was, um, you know, I, I was, I was in reflected light. Um, where there is a cannon wall that is facing me. Now, if you're if you're using these exact same settings on like on a digital SLR camera, um, yeah, I mean, at, at, in terms of light gathering, yeah, f forty five is what you'd use as far as calculating the exposure and all that. Um, but yeah, I, I was I'm basically I'm shooting up against a cannon wall, and then the sun is kind of rising from over the top of that wall, hitting the wall back behind me, sort of the opposite facing wall of the canyon. And then that sun reflects some really nice warm light into the shade of where I was standing. And so basically you're, I'm you're kind at of 300 millimeter though, three, 300 millimeters, but I'm, uh, you have the angle of view of about a 50 millimeter lens. Um, Does that so, translate into how close you are to the subject or are you still 300 millimeter far away? Um, no, I'm, I'm pretty close. Like if you're standing there with like a, like a full frame SLR and you have, you have a 50 millimeter lens on it, you're going to get same the thing. same, same thing. But the thing is, since the large format, the focal lengths are a lot longer in order to get something sort of equivalent. I have, I do have the depth of field of a 300 millimeter lens. So oh. that's where it gets a little bit tricky and large format. When you think of, you know, looking at large format landscape photos, you sort of think about seeing everything in focus, foreground, background, but it is actually insanely shallow depth of field on these cameras just because if you think about having you know a bigger sensor needs a uh, shallower depth of field um so it, it gets to be a little tricky uh in terms of trying to get the most important stuff sharp even at f45 um, but in this photo i just made sure that the uh the tree was sharp um, a good chunk of the foreground sandstone was sharp 
Um, but the wall back behind it, there's actually a little bit of a um, kind of a, a little bit outside the depth of field, which is which is fine. It kind of separates it from the background a little bit. The whole thing sounds interesting to me, though, because it's not just difficult, but it's actually kind of cool in that you get the field of view of a 50 with the depth of field of a 300. Mm-hmm. And I look at that purely as a creative tool. I mean, imagine if you could have on a, on an SLR a 50 millimeter that gave you that depth of field, that soft, nice, compressed depth of field of a 300. That would be an awesome tool to have in your bag. Yeah, it, it gives it kind of an interesting look. Um, it, it'd be kind of like if you're standing there next to me with a, uh, a full frame camera and you had a 300 millimeter lens on there and you're doing like a pretty enormous multi-row stitch of that where you just take a ton of pictures right. and a grid work, put them together with a 300 millimeter lens, you're gonna end up with something very similar to, to what I got just because you are using the same focal length at that point. but. Um, it, it, people, when they use large format for portraiture, there's all kinds of really cool things that they can do. I've never done that. I just use it for landscapes, um, do you but get, it, it is pretty cool. Do you get when you're using a 300 on, 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 I'm going to sound like such an idiot on this episode. My naivete is going to show through, uh, when you're shooting a long lens, like a 300 millimeter, regardless of the effect of, you know, field of view, when you're shooting that kind of a lens, on an eight by 10 film camera, do you get the the lens compression effect that you would normally get from a 300 or is that out the window? I, I think you'd get that mostly if you just crop into it to get to, uh, you know, crop into it heavily. Um, I, I think when you when you view the whole thing, you don't really get that quite as much. I think it's just because that that focal length really is compressed on like a full frame camera uh, just because it's such a long lens um, to get that sort of look on large format, you probably have to crop heavily into the image. Um, but also, I mean, I do have some longer lenses as well, which kind of give that look. And you're carrying those too, which is... Yeah, yeah the, the weird thing about large format is that my heaviest lens, my biggest lens is my wide angle lens. And my smallest and lightest lens, for the most part, is my longest lens. Um, so the, the wide angle lens kind of looks like an hourglass if you look at it from the side versus my, my longest lens, which is a 600 millimeter, which is equivalent to about a hundred millimeter lens or so on a full frame camera. That's actually one of my smallest lenses. So it's, it's kind of weird the way that works. So, so let's talk about really the shot itself for a second. Mm-hmm. The fact that you shot this on large format film, eight by 10 film, as opposed to uh, Canon, you know, high resolution 5d. What is it? 5dr or 5dsr or whatever. 5dsr. Yeah. Uh, you know, or a high resolution Sony nowadays or Nikon nowadays. What are you, what does the film large format film bring to landscape photography like this that you don't get other than that restriction? What does it bring to the image itself? In other words? So one of the reasons I was attracted to large format to begin with was the quality, because you can, in this case, this photo is taken on slide film and then I could scan that at however big I want. It could be hundreds and hundreds of megapixels. Um, which is really cool because you get some enormous quality because you have so much surface area. I mean, I could do very large prints and you don't even really see the grain just because since your film is starting out so big, you don't really have to magnify things all that dramatically in order to get the bigger print sizes. But, but basically I can, I can print it about any size I want. It just depends on how big I happen to actually scan that file. Um, and also I have a lot of cropping potential. I mean, if I wanted to, I can take a regular photo and just crop it down to, you know, long and skinny panoramic photo. And, uh, I would still have however, however much resolution I want, just so long as I made all the right decisions when I shot the photo to try to get things as, as sharp as possible in the most important areas. And scanned it as clean as possible. Exactly. And there's different ways of scanning them. I mean, this one right here, you're looking at, this was scanned on my uh, flatbed scanner at home. Um, but if I ever really want to do like a really big print of this, I'd actually send it off to be drum scanned, which is right. a much different way of scanning it. That gets really expensive. And I just reserve that for yeah, but the difference like is huge the best on, best. A drum sc- on a good drum yeah. scanner is amazing. Oh yeah. It's, it's really impressive what they can pull out. So this, this image, I'm kind of curious about a couple things having to do with, with composition, et cetera. Mm-hmm. When you shoot an image just generically though, what's your goal? When you set that camera down and you start framing your shot, in your head, 
what are you looking for here? Are, are you aware of that sandstone in the front as a you know foreground element, midground element, wall as a background element, or are you purely just in your head, hey, cool tree, really colorful background. I just want to focus on the tree. What 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 do you think of? It's kind of a combination of all that. I mean, I was uh, for this particular photo, I was walking through this canyon and I was just kind of looking around because it was the first time I had been to that canyon before. And I looked up and I saw that tree and I was really uh, drawn to it because it's a rather symmetrical tree. It has a really nice shape to it. And I like the fact that it was up against that sandstone wall. And anytime you see some sort of nice tree, whether it's a juniper like this or like a cottonwood, anytime you see it up against a nice sandstone wall, you always want to try to find some way to photograph it. Um, but I started by kind of moving around the tree uh, to try to find just the right angle. So I kind of emphasize the symmetry of that tree as much as possible. And then once I found that, I noticed that if I kind of took a step to the side, I can put the, um, the left side of the tree up against sort of a brighter area back behind the tree. And that kind of separated it from the background. Because one of the things I always try to find if I'm shooting something like this, I want to make sure that the the background sort of complements the tree. And I was able to have kind of a lighter sandstone area behind the left side and also behind the right side. Um, You've the actually just described shooting mm -hmm. a portrait. Y pre pretty much the same process. And I think it applies to a kind of a lots of different types of photography in general. You know, anytime you're working with any sort of background, it's just you want it to add to it as opposed to, you know, distracting from it. Separation. You want subject separation, mm -hmm. head in a clean spot, that type of a thing. Oh, for sure. And then the foreground... Um, I didn't really actually notice how cool that sort of cracked area would be in the sandstone until after the fact. I was just trying to make sure I had enough foreground so that the, the tree was kind of nicely grounded in the composition. And uh, I just centered it because you have this really nice shape to the tree. It's a very kind of symmetrical shape. And usually, you know, centering a subject in that sort of situation is, uh, is something that's kind of a powerful tool. So that's the reason I did that. What do you see through the camera? So it is upside down and backwards. It is, what you look okay. At. I've yeah. always, I wanted to know that. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's very dim. Uh, so that's why you have to have that cloth that you throw over the dark cloth. Um, it allows you to kind of look at it. But what's really cool about large format is that once you're under that dark cloth, once you're looking at that composition, you're kind of separated from reality. You're, it's almost like you're looking at it on TV as opposed to looking at it in reality. Um, so you can just kind of fine tune things as far as do I move the camera to the left, the right, up, down, kind of figure out how I'm going to compose it all. Um, but it is it is a very dim image and it can be a little hard to see at times. Um, this particular lens I used uh, for this photo is a really small, really lightweight lens I use for backpacking. And it doesn't let a lot of light in. I think it's an f8.5 is its best aperture. Um, but I, I use that to keep it lightweight. But that also means that my image in the the ground glass and the viewfinder in the back is, is also pretty dim. The, this image is so rich in color. Is that inherent to the film? Is that darkroom work? It's, it's, yeah, a lot of it's the film, a lot of it's the lighting. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that some of the branches on that tree have kind of a bit of a bluish color to them um, versus some of them have kind of more of a bit of an orangish. Um, part of that's because of the lighting. And I absolutely love shooting in reflected light because you have this really warm, soft light that just kind of makes anything look really nice but the blue comes from light reflected from the sky so you have this kind of this blue and also a little bit of orange it just makes things look really three-dimensional uh, this was shot on velvia 50 which is a slide film that has um, a good amount of contrast and saturation and it does really well in these sort of situations where you have a very controlled light very even light uh, it can go a little wild if it, you're shooting it you know, a sunrise or sunset. So I usually reserve it for sort of the calm light. Um, but this isn't, is not too far at all from our reality as far as the way it looked in that really nice warm light. What, what time uh, of day was this? So this was, I, I try, I try to, mm -hmm. to guess those things before yeah. I bring you on. And I'm looking at that crack and there's no harsh shadows. In fact, there's almost no shadows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So this was taken since, since well, since I'm in the shade here, um, it, it's going to be a nice soft light from that reflected light. But this was taken probably, I don't know, maybe eight, nine in the morning. Um, and basically I was just waiting for the, the sun to come up and start bouncing off the big, huge cliff face that's back behind me and reflect some light in the scene. But one thing I did have to wait for is for some clouds to go out of the way. Cause even like the, the faintest wispy little clouds overhead, even if they're not blocking the light, 
they reflect light down into the shadows. And you'll have this beautiful light and these little clouds go over and it just kills it. It makes it look really flat and really bluish and not really great. And uh, on this particular backpacking trip, um, I had four sheets of this particular film with me and I had four sheets of a different type of film. And this was actually the last sheet of film I had of this particular one. Um, I took two photos of the scene. Uh, the first one was decent. It was under um, decent light, but there's a little bit of clouds up in the sky. Um, but then I kind of walked away from the camera for a while, wandered around and saw that there was a break in the clouds. And I exposed my, my last sheet of Velvia on this one. And thankfully I had really nice conditions, no clouds, blue sky, lots of really nice reflected light. Um, and it was really calm too. There wasn't any wind. It doesn't well, see, matter that, on this one. That's what I get from this. I get kind of a calm strength, right? Mm -hmm. the, the angle adds strength kind of looking up at the tree, but then you have this calmness against the nice smooth back wall. And it, it's just a really nice, it, like you say, symmetry also. That That's why the centering works for it. In, in your head as a landscape photographer, especially somebody who shoots with, oh, by the way, this is about a three to four crop. Is this about the original crop of the film? Yeah, yeah, I uh, I basically didn't do any cropping. It's basically just straight from the straight from the film that way. Okay, so landscape shooters, what are the what, what's the key element or one or two key elements to a great landscape image to you? Uh, f I would say first of all that I the type of photography I do is a little bit different, I think, than what a lot of landscape shot shooters do because I, I kind of focus on the smaller scenes, kind of the more detailed things and. I don't have a lot of skies in the photos. It's kind of more, you know, photos like this where it's just kind of a calm scene. Um, but for me, I, I think one of the most important things is trying to find subjects that in some way tell a story. Um, and, I, and I think it builds sort of a connection with it. So I think, you know, trees do really well with that. Um, but in this case, um, I, I think the fact that, you know, you have this tree that's growing in relatively adverse conditions, kind of on the edge of the sandstone area, but um, it looks like it's kind of thriving there in, in, in these sort of harsh conditions and kind of builds a story about it. So for me, story always comes first. Um, obviously, you want to have really good lighting on that as well. Um, but I, I think that's one of the things that kind of, you know, you look at a picture of just a tree in a canyon somewhere, but somehow you almost picture it as being a person in a way and sort of, you know, surviving out there. So I, I think story is, is really important. Okay. I like that. Do you, you, you mentioned obviously scanning, you send these off, you said $10 or whatever for, for developing. So you don't mm -hmm. develop them yourself. No. When you scan them in, do you do any digital darkroom work to them? Oh yeah. Every, everything gets a little bit of work, but it's, it's mostly from the standpoint that, um, for example, this one was uh, taken on slide film and slide film. It's a very contrasty film. Um, and when you look at the image, when you look at that piece of film on a light box and you look at it, it's really, really beautiful. But sometimes it's hard to scan it even the way that it looks. So you have to kind of scan it with the shadows opened up a bit. And also if there's bright areas, make sure that, you know, you have enough detail in that. So you end up having kind of a little bit of a flat looking image. And so most of the work is actually spent just trying to get back to the way that that film originally looked. What, what um, do you use? Mostly just wise? curves. Curves is basically all I really in, end in up Light doing. Room or Photoshop? Uh, I use Photoshop. Okay. Um, and that's mostly what it is. Also, um, the same sort of philosophy as with digital applies to shooting slide film, where you want to kind of shoot to the right. You want to, you know, expose as bright as you can without overexposing anything, because you can always kind of darken things down. Um, and that's the other thing too, because slide film, if you're too bright, it's not good. If you're too dark, it's not good. Um, but I usually expose as bright as I can. So I have detail in the shadows and that can always darken it down a little bit. So usually I'll, I'll, I might darken the image down a little bit just to kind of get it back to where it should be. But, um, pretty, pretty minimal stuff. Color um, correcting in post. Uh, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes film flat out gets the color wrong. Um, sometimes it's fun how it gets it wrong. Sometimes it's not as fun. Uh, in reflected light like this, uh, Velvia almost always gets the color right so i didn't have to do any color correction on this one so i love the shot i'm really curious it would be so fascinating to be out there and watch you set this up and watch you shoot it because i can imagine that cloth going over your head and suddenly you are now in photographer mode i mean it's kind of beautiful that it it separates the photographer and makes them focus on their art it would be fascinating to try sometime if if you were to give one tip 
general landscape photography tip to people who want to get better at landscape photography, which is what you do so well, what would the tip be? I think the main thing that is important for landscape photography is is not being rushed. You really need to take your time. Um, I, I find that if I'm going to go to any sort of location and walk away with some photos I really like, honestly, I like to spend about a week there. I mean, if, if you just go for a day or two, um, it's hard because you don't really get to know the place really well. So, so I'm a big fan of, you know, spending a lot of time at a location. You'll start noticing things you didn't really notice before, but also keep returning to those same areas again and again. Um, a lot of photographers these days kind of travel all over the world and go to all these exotic locations. But um, I, I just kind of keep visiting the same two general places over and over again. Uh, Zion and Death Valley, this is taken into place other than Zion, but by just getting to know those areas, um, I, I think you kind of, it's important to be very observant and sort of you'll find stuff that way. So along with your photography, I know on your website and people can look this up. You also do portfolio reviews. Mm -hmm. You do one-on-one -on -one consulting. Mm -hmm. If people want to find more about, find out more about Ben Horn, what's your website? Uh, my website is benhorn.com and it's a uh, B E N H O R N E.com. Okay. And then you're also on YouTube same. It's just Ben Horn on YouTube. If you search for me on there, uh, it'll pull it up. Also, it's linked to through uh, from my website. And the YouTube thing, seriously, you need to go look at these videos, these behind the scene, uh, you know, video blogs that he does, video diaries or journals, because they're amazing. I love your production, by the way, on them too. Really, really nice. Uh, you're also on Facebook, Ben Horn Photo, Instagram, Ben Horn Photo, <laughs> and Twitter, it's just Ben Horn. So everybody reach out, go check out Ben Horn's work. And Ben, thanks a lot, man, for being here. It's awesome, man. I, I, I had a lot of fun. Well, and you're close to me. So now we need to get together and have a beer. And I want to see your camera. Nice. Yes, for sure. I'll let you carry it around. Again, to everybody, thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Behind the Shot. I'm your host, Steve Brazel. Be sure to go to thisweekinphoto.com and check out the blog post associated with this episode. Until next time, we will see you soon. Hey there, I'm Frederick Van Johnson. Thanks for checking out the TWIP Network on YouTube. If you'd like to keep up to date with the shows we're putting out, be sure to click subscribe. And while you're at it, give us a thumbs up. You can also subscribe on thisweekinphoto.com where you'll find lots of other great photography shows. Thanks for watching the TWIP Network on YouTube.